All right, here we're going to take a look at part two for our video series on isoparametric quadrilateral elements. This series being focused on linear isoparametric quadrilateral elements. So that means elements that have four nodes. In this part, we're going to take a look at the strain displacement matrix. And that's what we have highlighted in this stiffness matrix equation is that matrix B. That's our strain displacement matrix. How the heck does that come about? Well, before we get started, let's go ahead and take a look at the review or review the Jacobian matrix. A Jacobian matrix being what maps our natural coordinates to the global coordinate system. And so here's our weird shaped quadrilateral element. There's xi and eta, our natural coordinates inside the element. And here is our global coordinates. Remember that xi and eta, these measure the fractional distances throughout that element. And so at node one, those coordinates and natural coordinates would be minus one, minus one. Similarly, for node three, that would be one, one in xi eta coordinates. Okay, so we'll go ahead and look at the equation for our Jacobian matrix. And looking at x and y, our position functions there that we can write in terms of our nodal shape functions and the corresponding nodal displacements. And we go ahead and expand this equation with these and we can expand it to the following matrix equation all right so this is our equation for the jacobian matrix and with that we can go ahead and take a look back at the stiffness matrix equation let's see all right so we have this stiffness matrix equation. We know the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. We investigated that in part one. Our constitutive matrix, I think we investigated that in uh, maybe in part one or possibly in the constant strain triangle uh, video where we have really it's just based on Hooke's law. That's the material properties, our elastic modulus, Poisson ratio, and it depends on what condition we're assuming, plane stress or plane strain. We have our thickness of the element, and now we have the last part, which is our strain displacement matrices. Okay, and so we want to figure out, well, how do we get those? And we want to get those in terms of xi and eta so that we can integrate it within the rest of this function. All right, so as the name implies, the strain displacement matrix is able to relate strains to displacements. All right. So there's our vector of strains. There is our equations that we have for each of the strain values. There are some high order terms, but we're neglecting those and those equations. This is actually quite similar to what we saw for the constant strain triangle uh, matrix. So when we went ahead and derived that, same type of equations, same type of ideas, right? Having our displacements written in terms of our individual shape functions and the nodal displacements that correspond to it. We expand this out same way that we did for the triangle element. And we could say easy peasy, but here's where things get a little bit more difficult than it did for the triangle element. Remember for the triangle element, those displacements were in terms of X and Y. The shape functions were in terms of X and Y. But in this case, our shape functions are not in terms of X and Y. They're in terms of natural coordinates. And so since they're in terms of natural coordinates, that makes it a little bit more difficult to take the derivatives of our displacement functions with respect to x and y. So here's our shape functions, there's our element, there's the locations of our nodes in terms of our natural coordinates. And so we're trying to figure out how can we take the derivatives of these shape functions with respect to x and y. If there was only some type of coordinate system mapping mechanism, okay, my lead up's not very funny. You know what the answer is. It's the Jacobian matrix. So this is meant to be super Jacobian. All right, I didn't spend a lot of time thinking of the idea for this, just J with a K. But anyway, the Jacobian matrix does save the day. It does allow us to take those derivatives by mapping between the global and local coordinates. And we can do that by making this 
or pardon me, making this recognition here, right? The derivatives of our shape functions with respect to our natural coordinates are equal to this Jacobian matrix multiplied by the derivatives of our shape functions with respect to x and y. And so if that's our Jacobian matrix, we can go ahead and invert that in order to find our derivatives of our shape functions with respect to x and y. Just by inverting it, bring it to the other side. We can take these relatively easily. We already have this, so now we can find these. Okay, so here's an example where we're going to use to put this all together. So we'll just take some representative element. There's four nodes. There are the global coordinates for those nodes. The first step is we're going to go ahead and find the Jacobian matrix. All right, so we have our Jacobian matrix. And this is just copied from before. Same equation as what we had before. Same equation as what we had in part one, actually. All right, we'll just make those substitutions like we had in part one and replace that with the coordinates of our element and from that we can go ahead and write out what the Jacobian matrix is just making all those substitutions and then doing the matrix math so now we go ahead and invert the Jacobian matrix normally you don't have to do this this is what the computer does but we're doing it by hand just to well, I guess not by hand. I guess I've already written this out. I'm just kind of pressing play a little bit. But we're doing this in detail slowly just to show how everything works. And so now we go ahead and look at our strain displacement matrix. We know that it could be represented in terms of each of the individual shape functions the derivatives of those with respect to x and y there is our matrix of nodal displacements that's b we're going to go ahead and select one component of that matrix so we go ahead and write out the whole matrix there we're just going to go ahead and take a look at that upper left component just one singular value and we can find that by taking the, or we already have the inverse of the matrix, right? So we're just taking those individual values. We're taking the derivatives of those. We'll do that over here. All right, so there's our same values that we had before over here. What's this? This is the inverted Jacobian matrix. What are these? This is we go to the previous slide, right? That top value, that's what we have here. That's the derivative of the first shape function with respect to xi. The second value, that's what we have over here. That's that second value, the derivative of the shape function with respect to eta. All right. And so if we go ahead and do that. We can find an expression for the derivative of our shape function, first shape function for node one with respect to x. Recognizing that anything times zero is zero, we just go ahead and get rid of that term. We can go ahead and simplify it. And that's what we get for that one value. Now you just go ahead and repeat the process for the other seven unique terms. Yeah, we got to take the derivative of four different shape functions, each of those with respect to x and y. So eight different terms. And that provides our stiffness, or primary, our strain displacement matrix B. All right. So. I just kind of wrote a lot of what many of you might be thinking. That seems like a lot of computation for one single term in B. That is, by the way, just one small part of the total stiffness matrix equation, which, by the way, again, is a double integral. And so, <laughs> also, there are tons of elements. You know, just, this is kind of the way the brain spirals sometimes, right? Like, how can this be solved so quickly in its commercial software? All right, and the answer is that we'll cover in part three is Gauss quadrature. So Gauss quadrature is a numerical integration technique that really makes all of this much more simple. In fact, it changes this integral into summation, summation, which makes this much easier to perform. Okay. So, moving on to the reflection questions.
The first reflection is, what is the different terms, what are the different terms within the Stiptus matrix equation for an isoparametric quadrilateral element? What is T? What is B? What is C? What is J? What is Xi? What is Zeta? What are all those things? And next, why is the Jacobian matrix necessary when solving for the strain displacement matrix? All right, so that's the next one that we have. All right, that should conclude part two, part two of our exploration of linear isoparametric quadrilateral elements. This video looked and focused on the strain displacement matrix B.